I would also like to take a moment to thank um, Paco, uh, Dr. Moreno, Fernandez, uh, and everyone involved in, in putting this together. It's wonderful. Um, let me say that I come from, uh, I was born in Cuba, but I, I come from Florida. And since we are here talking about Spanish in all of these different uh, areas, um, Spanish was spoken in Florida before English was spoken in, the United, in what is today the United States. So we need to um, señalar, we need to point that out, we need to, to remember that um, because there are a lot of myths uh, in this country about languages. And, well, of course, there were all the indigenous languages that are spoken in what is the United States, but um, Spanish was the first European language uh, to be spoken in this territory. And it was much sooner, much earlier in, in the history than English, which was, you know, when the pilgrims arrived here in this, in this area, Plymouth Rock, Jamestown, the colony, and so on. So let us remember that, and in particular because I come from Florida, um, there was continuous use of Spanish in my particular state, except for a brief period where England um, had Florida and then gave it back to Spain. Um, so Spanish has been spoken continuously in, in my state, um, and it continues to be spoken now quite a bit. And in fact, um, I want to mention also, because this is the Cervantes Institute, that Miami uh, is the city in the United States that has the largest number of Spaniards. So that is also something to, to note um, because of the crisis and everything that so many Spaniards have had to go to find jobs elsewhere all over the world. And they even have a, a, a program in, in Spain called Españoles por el Mundo. Mm which I watch, um, and so Miami is, is a big center of, of Spaniards. So I, I, before I read some things, and I think sometimes it's better to talk a little bit at, as a warm-up at least, I'd like to, to start with um, telling you a couple of, of uh, anecdotes or stories that, that, have to do, that has to do with um, the first one um, with myself, um, because I am a product of the heritage language instructional program in Miami-Dade County. Um, like I said, I was born in Cuba, but I came to the United States uh, when I was about nine, nine years old uh, with a fourth grade education. So of course, by that time, you speak Spanish, you know how to read and write, more or less, but you still don't have the literacy level that, that you would want to have to be more you know, academic uh, development and so on. But the Miami that I arrived in uh, back in 19, uh, 62, was a very different reality uh, from the Miami that we know today. So when I arrived, um, I did not speak English. Uh, I only spoke Spanish, of course. I was living in Cuba until, you know, we had, some of us had to leave at that point. Um, in 62 is when we arrived, and I started public school. And in the public school at that time, um, Coral Way Elementary, which as you know is the famous school uh, which developed a, a wonderful bilingual curriculum that was later used as a model to, to copy other bilingual programs around the country. But in 63 is when it was created, not in 62 when I arrived. So there was no bilingual uh, program at that time. So I just go to a regular American you know, public school. And um, as you know, in the, or as you know, in the United States, there aren't that many programs at the elementary level for children to study foreign languages. There are some now, but there is no uniformity, and there are very few and far between. They're hard to find. And back in 1962, you know, there was very few. So what, what they did have at my school um, was a regular, I don't even know whether I should call it regular, it was a program to teach Spanish to the little kids, but not to the heritage speakers, not to native speakers, but Spanish as a foreign language. And it was like a couple of times a week or something like two or three times a week. And the class, I'll never forget, consisted of going to the cafeteria and having monitors, televisions placed in front of the kids, my class. And there would be this talking head 
on the monitor and we had to repeat words you know, or phrases like, buenos dias, buenos dias. And of course, to me, that was totally inappropriate and boring because I spoke Spanish. I did not speak English, I spoke Spanish. But the reason I'm telling you this story is that the teacher who actually walked us to the cafeteria so we could watch the talking heads, Mrs. Blair, she did not speak Spanish and she was the teacher. <laughs> that teacher, this was my experience in the US in Miami with my first Spanish class. Remember, I did not speak English. That teacher gave me an F in my Spanish class. I'm serious. That teacher gave me an F. Why did that teacher give me an F when I was the only person in that class who could speak Spanish? Because I did not understand the instructions that I was given in English, of course, <laughs> to memorize some dialogue that I was supposed to recite in front of the class. So, I mean, I won't say anything about whether maybe she didn't like Hispanics or didn't like me, I don't know. But I did get in the report card an F, which I showed my mother. And of course, my mother was a teacher in Cuba in a normal school, you know, one of those normal preparations, you know, teachers, schools, you know, in Havana. So she was like, live it, you know, but of course she was too busy trying to survive to feed us, to go complain, you know. But that was my first experience getting an F in my Spanish class as a nine-year-old. Things have changed quite a bit since then. And to, to show you how much change there is, I will tell you my second little anecdote. And that is that about two or three weeks ago, I happened to have been invited to go to um, the University of Arkansas, of all places. Now, if you had told me many years ago, Ana Roca, you're going to receive an invitation to go do a workshop for the faculty and for teachers at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. I would not have believed it. I would have said, what? The University of Arkansas? They're interested in Spanish as a heritage language in Arkansas? And so that's to tell you how much things have changed. That a university that I would have never thought of as having a lot of Spanish speakers or being interested in methodologies, ped pedagogies for teaching native speakers would actually invite someone to help train or you know, help talk about these issues in a university that I, I didn't think they would have that many Spanish speakers there at the college level. Well, guess what? They do. They do. And what happens is that um, they're not sure sometimes how to proceed or what to do with these classes or what materials they can choose from or are available, or what methodologies the faculty who never got any training in teaching language arts, because it's similar to teaching language arts in this country, they don't know what to do. Because faculty have been trained, if anything, because many, if they're either PhDs in literature or PhDs in linguistics, they've had very limited training in teaching. They just kind of throw you out there, go teach Spanish, you know, and you survive somehow. Although in the last 15 to 20 years, there has been a movement to train faculty to at least, when they're teaching assistants, get supervision, get training, um, there's coordination, they go to workshops, they go to professional development seminars, they're required sometimes to take an applied linguistics class or something in pedagogy so that when they go out there looking for a job, they can say, oh look, look, they did study something to do with pedagogy, they did take second language acquisition, oh look, they took studies in bilingualism, so th this is a better candidate we should hire, oh look, even better, they took some courses and have experience teaching Spanish as a heritage language because our university is full of them now, so we need that person instead of the other one. So things have changed now, um, not sufficiently in my view, but they have changed in that there's at least uh, much more of an awareness. Um, here, I'm so glad now that at Harvard they have uh, Spanish as a heritage language, and in many other schools that they, they didn't before. I used to be very angry years ago about some universities, you know, in theory, um, because I would hear I have colleagues at universities that were in cities that I knew had a lot of Hispanics, like, for example, the University of Texas at Austin. I couldn't believe that with the very nice PhD programs that they have there in linguistics and in Spanish, they never offered Spanish for native speakers for years. Uh, or other universities, too. UCLA, which has the Heritage Language Center. Well, are they teaching Spanish as a heritage language? Yes, they, are. Mm -hmm. they are now, but they weren't before. So that's the, the irony that some of these uh, universities that are centers for research in these areas and in bilingualism, yet you go to the department next door where they're actually teaching the language. They don't have the heritage program. So things have been changing, which I think is wonderful and positive. Um, so anyhow, that's just by way of introducing the topic. Um, 
which is Spanish in the U.S. And with this story, at least it gives you, a, I don't know, a framework, something to think about. But um, what I wanted to say is um, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about, and I'll read a little bit, uh, about U, uh, U.S. Hispanics and the Spanish that's used in the United States, okay? One typical misconception that we always hear um, about U.S. Latinos, or however we want to call ourselves, U.S. Latinos, U.S. Hispanics, um, is that we're all pretty much alike uh, and that, you know, we all... Uh, speak a non-standard Spanish. Oh, that's U.S. Spanish. And they say it in a derogatory fashion. Ah, pero es un español de los Estados Unidos. Okay. So when we talk about the Spanish of the U.S., well, who's Spanish are we talking about? Can we really talk about Spanish of the U.S.? And that's a question that I have for all of you because there may be certain characteristics, perhaps things that we share, the code switching that uh, we, we do at different levels and so on. But when we speak about Spanish in the U.S., we're really talking about a Spanish that reflects so many Spanishes, so a variety of Spanish of everybody who's been coming here. And they have been coming from everywhere in the Spanish-speaking world, even though the Mexican-American Spanish is the largest group, of course. So, that, so when we hear Spanish of the U.S., people tend to think Mexican. And yes, it's over 60% of Hispanics are from Mexico or Mexican-American, you know. But we have a lot of Central Americans now that have been coming. That's the other large group. And that's also a mixed group because, you know, you have Guatemala, you have Honduras. You have a lot of people coming from Central America. You have children now coming unaccompanied. That's the latest crisis that the, this uh, country is having. You have unaccompanied minors being, you know, being sent to get away from a lot of violence in Honduras, in other places. What is the U.S. doing with these children? So you have more people coming in constantly. From what I've read more recently, even though the immigration has slowed down a little bit because of all the, you know, sending people back now, people are like, okay, maybe not so many people coming. But even so, the population is still shooting up. And how is that happening when we have, in terms of percentages in comparison from other years, fewer people coming in because of the border patrol and all of that, the population is still going up. Birth rates, the birth rates of Hispanics, it's still going up, having more children. So all the projections that I've read from the, the Pew Center, which are you know coming out all the time, is that the projections are incredible. We're going to be an even more Hispanic uh, country. And I don't know, maybe for the discussion later, what, how are we handling that in the United States in terms at least of, um, my area is not law, so I won't refer to that, but in terms of education, how are we handling the fact that we are becoming a much more Hispanic country in every way? We see it in the media, we see it in the street, and it's gonna be a lot of variation depending on the cities and the people you're talking to and the numbers of people that are there, living there. The other thing that we're noticing is that a lot of, um, of places in the United States that we never thought of as Hispanic, like Arkansas, okay? Mm -hmm. Those are now the ones that are having enormous Hispanic population growth, okay? And a lot of what is happening from what I read is that a lot of Mexicans and Mexican Americans are moving to other states, southern states. Their Hispanic population has been shooting up. It's just, you know, places like Georgia, North and South Carolina, Arkansas, places that normally we don't think of them as a Hispanic state. I mean, we always think of the traditional Spanish speaking places, you know, California, of course, Texas, you know. Um, in Chicago, there, there's a lot of Hispanics, of course, and New York, Florida. Those are the traditional, Colorado, you know. But now we're talking about Georgia. <laughs> we would never think before of Georgia as having a lot of Hispanics. I would never think before of Florida as having a lot of Mexicans. And guess what? The largest Hispanic group, population group in Florida is Mexican. And to me, that's interesting because I'm in Miami, but I don't see many Mexicans in Miami. They're scattered all over the state. There's some, a lot in Homestead, a large population in Homestead. So all of the, the, the population uh, is changing uh, quite a bit. And so um, what people also have, have these uh, myths about people are always talking using so-called Spanglish or code switching. 
and you know the the alternation of, of linguistic codes well that has had a, a negative um, connotation for for a long time in associations but what is obvious to linguists is that because of the natural contact between English and Spanish for centuries, we can easily note that each language influences the other in some way to a greater or lesser degree. And because English is de facto the official um, language, even if it's not the legal officially uh, you know, in the country, um, it, it is the, the language that's used for business, for the professions in general. We can observe much more how English impacts Spanish rather than a Spanish impacting English. Although there are some studies that have been coming out also of how Spanish is impacting English. Um, we observe more and hear more the borrowings from English, okay? The in utterances in Spanish, that's what we hear more. You know, te mando un, un email, or we're switching back and forth all the time. And what's interesting, something like that, that you might hear people say, te voy a mandar un email. I'm going to send you an email. And you switch. Te voy a mandar un email. I just read a little note that the Academia, Real Academia de la Lengua de Norte America is sending that word to be uh, considered into the dictionary. And I keep wondering, you know, because people are using it, but I keep wondering, okay, if they incorporate that, are they going to say email and say it in English? Or are they going to say email, email? Because if they say email, I'll never understand them. <laughs> you know, so that, that's what happens sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. So there, you know, there are a lot of things that people are, are using that are not standard. You know, I hear things like, Mama, ya llegó el rufero. You know, rufero, the roofer. Or they'll say, que viene para arreglar el liqueo. He's coming to fix the leak, you know, salidero, escape de agua, whatever. Uh, tiene que llamar para atrás y decirte que día viene. He has to, you know, call you back, llamar para atrás. So we hear all these things that um, are not standard Spanish. They're incorporating from, from the English. Um, so we know it's such an arbitrary thing, what we're going to accept or not accept. And, you know, sometimes I tell my students, okay, tell me from one to ten. Some of these things that are Spanish that are not standard. Tell me how much it bothers you, you know, because there's some things that we're so used to hearing them that we we say it's okay, <laughs> and there are others that we, you know, are back arches, and we're like no. So in reality, the Spanish spoken in the United States is a reflection then of the numerous Hispanic cultures uh, and many linguistic varieties of the speakers who use it in the various contexts with different degrees of oral proficiency. Thus, the Spanish used in the United States will vary then according to the various major groups and other recent immigrant groups who are now here. And in that sense, the majority of U.S. Latinos are Mexican or Mexican-American background. The majority of the Spanish spoken in the U.S. reflects that variety of Mexican and Mexican-American Spanish, particularly in those states that are heavily populated with the, this heterogeneous group, like California, Texas, and so on. Now, Puerto Rican Spanish in the mainland, uh, also heavily influenced by daily contact with English, is found primarily in the largest enclaves, uh, metropolitan areas like New York, Chicago, Boston. Um, but like Mexican population, as well as the Cuban American population, they also reside all over the United States now, and not just in quote unquote barrios, you know, uh, which is interesting to me. So because when in Miami, when people come to Miami, they want to go to the Pequeña Habana, you know, as if that were like the place where Cubans are. Well, guess what? They're, they're not just in the little barrio called Pequeña Habana. They're all over. It's almost like the Pequeña Habana is now actually a mix of many other uh, Spanish speakers that have ended up uh, in that uh, area or section of Miami. So Cuban and Cuban Americans, I'm just doing this as sort of a re quick review. Cuban and Cuban Americans are found primarily, of course, in Miami, but there are considerable numbers that are in Union City, New Jersey, many who had relocated in the early 60s to places like Illinois and California, and went back to Miami eventually, many of them for retirement. So you do have that, that group of Cubans who, you know, they were relocated in the early 60s because they had jobs there. There was the relocation program, which my family um, was offered, and we were among those that said no. And, and like in 1962, when we arrived, my, my mother who was here with the, my, my brother, myself, and my grandmother, we received a letter saying, we have found you a job in Oregon. And we were like, oh, where is that? We look at the map. 
ay no, eso está muy lejos de Cuba. And we're, and of course, we're going to go back in six months, right? Because Castro was going to fall, the government was not going to last, so we wanted to stay close to Cuba. So here we are, 56 years later, <laughs> he's still there, okay? Um, but there's a lot of those older Cubans who came back to Miami once they retired. It was like the Mecca, you know, go back to Miami when you retire so you won't be so cold in places where they had ended up in. They would give you a one one way ticket and a job, uh, so that that was that program then. Um, so there are a lot of Central and South American um, Hispanics now that have that have entered. Of course, in the 1980s, with all of the uh, dictatorships that you were talking about, uh, too. So that brought a lot more people from like Argentina, Chile, you know, all kinds of places. I mean, the whole map of Latin America was full of military dictatorships at that time, and they were going out everywhere. Um, the other topic that, that, which is really what I want to talk about more, is the issue of language maintenance in the United States. Everybody always um, kind of talks about, well, what is the future of Spanish in the United States? And I've been going to conferences for years now, listening to people talk about the future of, of Spanish in the United States. And for many years, um, some of my great colleagues that I admire very much would say, oh, it's going to get lost. Where the Spanish is being lost because by the third generation, it's lost. And, um, it's, it's not going to last, even though there are more immigrants coming. It's not going to last. They're losing their Spanish. There's a theory, of course, in, in linguistics that says, you know, by the second or third generation, it starts getting lost. And it's true that while in many cases it is lost. On the other hand, what we have been seeing for the last three decades, at least, is that the population has gone mm. so high. It keeps going up and up and up. It's at what now is like 17% of the US population is Hispanic, okay? And it's, gonna, it's predicted that it's gonna be 25% very soon, I forget what year, but it, all, those projections are always wrong in that it's reached sooner, sooner than what they predict. So what I, you know, I'm seeing is that because there are more people coming, it's, that's like a shot in the arm of more Spanish. And so that helps a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of variety. There's no doubt about that. There will be people in their circumstances, in their family, in their schooling, in their city, that the conditions, all the things that will affect language maintenance may not be quite there for them to keep the language as perhaps they may have wanted to. But there are also going <coughs> to be, on the other hand, conditions that will enable people to maintain their Spanish and to keep using it. And when you have situations where the language is viewed as something positive and not negative, then that helps that condition a lot more. And that, I think, is the case, for example, in the city that I happen to live in, in Miami. And I think one big difference in, in Miami, from, and I've traveled a lot in the United States and talked to Hispanics and linguists, fellow linguists and so on, is that in Miami, generally, you can speak Spanish uh, I will have to say this in Spanish, sin pelos en la lengua, you know, meaning that you can use Spanish without fear. You can go out and just switch back and forth. There is no issue about it. Okay, so you talk to somebody in, in Spanish and you see they don't understand you. Well, most people are bilingual, so you switch to English. But, you know, right now I think the people who may be feeling a little bit left out are actually those that don't speak Spanish. So as soon as you're there, you're, this, the concentration of speakers is what's important there. In other cities, maybe the Spanish speakers are more spread out. So you're not as, uh, as likely to encounter them mm -hmm. that quickly. Or in other big cities like New York, you have people from so many places uh, who speak so many languages um, in many great numbers, too. So you're not sure if you're in public transportation if I'm going to ask you in what language, because you may be from somebody else. But the likelihood that in Miami you can find somebody waiting for a bus or a transportation, it's very bad, the transportation, by the way, but you're, you're there and you find somebody and you start speaking, you know, I find her and say, ay, que tal, you know, ay, I didn't realize you speak another language, but okay, but the likelihood is very high that that person is going to answer you in Spanish, or if they don't, that they understand you. So I think that while you have these two movements going on, you will, of course, have people who will lose the language or get weaker. They may not transfer it to their children, but at the same time, you have a lot of other people who are doing that, okay? But what is important to talk about is in terms of schooling, 
what are we doing in the United States in terms of providing heritage language instruction that will help those people who do want to maintain and develop their Spanish? And, and that's key. And th the problem is in, that in the United States, it's not just a question of the instruction for heritage language speakers. It's also a question of foreign language instruction in general. You have to put it on the greater scheme of things. Because what we observe here in the US, and there have been so many studies and reports from the government, which is the one that's very interested in foreign language competency, particularly now because it's an issue of security. After 9-11, it became even more an issue of security. But of course, the languages that they have been focusing on are the less commonly taught languages, the Arabic, the Chinese, the Pashto, the, all the different languages of issues that we're having uh, in Asia or the Middle East. And so the emphasis has been that. But for a long time, for example, the Title VI uh, grant of the Department, the US Department of Education, for a long, long time, we could not even write a grant that would involve anything to do with the word bilingualism. And in fact, we had at my university, at Florida International University, we had the Title VI grant for many years. We had it with the University of Florida in conjunction and sometimes by ourselves. But I, I remember one time I wanted to write in something to do with doing something for our heritage language program. They said, no, we're not allowed. This grant is only for foreign languages, you know, and other things, area studies. But it was not even allowed. You could not put in the grant application anything to do with bilingualism or heritage speakers. Things have changed. Things are changing. UCLA has this center. You can now apply for things that have to do with heritage language speakers, not Spanish alone, but they're interested now in the heritage language speakers of all these other less commonly taught languages because it is also an issue of security. But beyond the issue of security, it is an issue of globalization. It is an issue of business. It is an issue of being able to communicate with people that you can make money with and trade and so on. So people have realized that it takes, uh, we know the facts, the government uh, is interested in knowing how much money, how much time it takes to train someone of average intelligence to reach broom, a high level of competency called professional competency in those um, uh, scales used by the Foreign Service Institute to measure oral proficiency. So they know, they did these things decades ago. And so they know that one way is to actually train the person for so many hours, for so many years, actually. What's an alternative? One alternative is, well, we have these heritage speakers running around all over the United States. We have these minority language speakers. Let's get them and see what we need to do to raise their registers, raise their literacy, raise their competency. And so now they're interested, finally, in the heritage speakers, in the government, you no know, other agencies, the MLA, uh, AATSB, all of the professional organizations have woken up in the last 30 years. Before, they were really dormant. They were not doing anything. The uh, American Association um, of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, which is you know, the one we work with, they, uh, back in 1977, uh, presented um, a stance, a policy that was published in Hispania, their journal, basically saying, yes, our stance is that wherever there are students, uh, pupils of uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish-speaking students, we must provide separate tracks of instruction for them that are appropriate, pedagogically appropriate, with appropriate materials and the instruction. And it, you know, they said more than that, of course, but that was published in 1977. And for, for a long time, about 20 years, even though they published that and they stood by it, what did they do for about 20 years? Nothing. They did basically nothing. So it wasn't until not really that long ago, maybe about 10 years ago, that um, uh, oh, what is his name? One of the, the direct, executive directors, uh, Sandstedt, of the organization said, "I want to do something about this because we've published this, but what did we do? And now there's an interest, and now there's more Spanish students in the classrooms, and more teachers calling. This is what he told me personally. He said they're calling my association and asking me, what do I do?" I have these students in my class. I'm not prepared to teach native speakers. I was trained to teach Spanish as a foreign language. So he took it upon himself 
to get together, you know, different people who put together uh, a little their first volume of, you know, to be used in workshops to train teachers all around the country. He was interested. So there has been like uh, a history of development in this area where you had, for example, ACTFL, you know, ACTFL, the American Council of the Teaching of Foreign Languages. That came out from the MLA many years ago. Um, they also developed an interest, little by little. All the different major professional organizations and agencies have been developing an interest. It's taken time. It's taken a lot of time. So now that we have developed the interest, because now you have the AATSP on board, you have ACTFL with its own special interest group, which I helped co-found years ago, which that guarantees that during every convention there is room for that topic. And there usually is like a panel on research and a panel uh, for high school teaching and another panel on something else. It's open. So that guarantees space in those major organizations to be able to discuss things. Um, there's also the National Foreign Language Center. All of these different organizations that have taken an interest. The MLA, which has a, a summer institute for um, directors of programs and department chairs, they've had presentations on this topic. So in general, in a national sense, there has been a, a, a new awareness of a need of this new population that's in our classrooms from you know, elementary school, middle school, secondary, high school, and college. They've all been trying to work together. Part of the problem, as I see it, is that this is all great that they're all working together, but there's a problem also of lack of sufficient review of programs, lack of supervision of programs, and in fact, lack of programs, period, in some places where they need to have the programs and need all of the things that have been going on for the last 20, 30 years. Um, and then there's the, the issue of the, the, um, the training. What do you do in the classroom? So if, uh, how much time do I have? About five, five minutes? Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll move ahead. <laughs> okay. um, the course that most teachers end up teaching is the intermediate level or native speakers. Why intermediate? Why do we call it intermediate? Because a lot of them already do speak Spanish. They know, at least they understand Spanish. So we're not going to call it elementary. There are very few. In my university, we don't teach at all elementary Spanish for, as a heritage language. We're in Miami. We know they all understand and they speak. <clears throat> so um, basically, I see that there are three different environments that are very important. There is um, the um, the home environment, of course, is the most important that, that we need to pay attention to. And they come with all of these very informal skills in, in the language, conversational skills, uh, and so on. But the, um, the home environment is key. It's the parents, it's the families, where they learned um, their Spanish. But that Spanish is more of a fa familiar. It's more of a home Spanish. They lack the schooling, they lack the academic language, uh, and so on. So the formal language learning environment of the classroom is very important, and for many, this is the first class that they have. Um, and of course, you're going to find a very mixed class where some have come from Latin America when they were four years old, or some were nine years old, or some were born in the United States. So the teacher is faced with a very mixed level of, of, of a classroom. And what I have seen is that it makes sense in these classes to include topics that are of interest to the students, to get them hooked, to get them engaged, because you cannot treat them as little kids starting from scratch, and they have a lot of erroneous ideas about what the things that they should be learning in the classroom. And that's step number one. They'll say things to me like, maestra, es que yo no sé gramática. Okay. And I have to, and I explain to them, I dedicate part of a class to talking about language because I think it's very important for them. They come with erroneous ideas. I say, you do have grammar, of course you have grammar. If you don't have grammar, we wouldn't be having this conversation that we're having in Spanish. I said, you, what you lack is the uh, meta language about grammar. You don't know what things are called. If I tell you, plus cuan perfecto, oh, well, they don't care, okay. But they're using it sometimes, you know. Um, so the thing is that they need to develop the oral registers as well because the oral registers they have are very informal. And for the last like 20 years, these classes have focused a lot on grammar, unfortunately. And what happens then? Teachers that just go to the board and start doing very formal grammar things, the students go, 
They just fall asleep. They just like that. No. So you need to, in this first course, that may only be the only course they take if they cannot afford to take other classes in their schedule, you need to get them hooked so that they're interested in their language for life after that class is over. So the class is over, and it, at least in that class, they have a better self-concept about their Spanish and their Hispanic background. They realize that the way they speak is because that's the way they speak, you know. Um, that they, they're, they've grown up bilingually. They, they did not grow up in a Spanish-speaking country, but they realize in that class that they can improve their Spanish and they can get ahead. And you try to encourage them to continue taking because they need to understand it takes time to develop um, abilities in the language, just like people are taking English and they're Americans and they take English class, right? You take English class every year. It takes a long time to develop literacy, better skills in every way, orally, in writing, reading, vocabulary. If they understand that in that class, many of them do go on because they realize the importance of Spanish in their lives, not only for their own identity uh, development as a Hispanic, as a Spanish-speaking person, but in terms of jobs. I tell them, look, um, Thomas Boswell, who's a social uh, geographer at the University of Miami, he conducted a study where he showed that people who said they were um, competent in both English and Spanish were making $7,000 more a year in Miami. So I said, if you're, you know, this is such a materialistic society we live in, if you're interested in money, hey, look, it will also help you uh, to get uh, more money. Um, but besides that, you know, it's the whole idea of opening doors for them, uh, not just money. My own textbook, which is called Nuevos Mundos, I call it that for a reason, because I think that as teachers, what we're doing in these classes is exactly abriendo puertas, abriendo mundos, opening up new worlds to them. For example, I ask in my class, well, how many of you have ever seen a film in Spanish? Maybe one or two hands go up in 30. And I said, que horror. You have a wonderful world of films from Spain, from Mexico, from many parts. You're missing a whole world of film. Aren't you interested in films? And so I, I have them see films outside of class. They're available now in Netflix, in the library. They're easy to get. They write film reviews, that we discuss them, that they're practicing, they're listening to the, the Spanish in the films, they're learning in context, culturally, they're discussing them, they're writing about them. You get to practice all of those skills at the same time. So besides the, uh, the environment that's so important of the home, the parents, and the formal classroom environment, then you have the community environment as the third environment that is so important as well. It's not the same thing to teach Spanish as a heritage language in Miami as it would be to teach Spanish as a heritage language in Arkansas or some other place. The community is so important as well if you have access to a Spanish-speaking community. You can do things in the classroom like I do to make sure that during the semester, they have to go to several events in the community that are held in Spanish. I give them you know, ample opportunities of things and let them know what's going on at bookstores, at here or there, but they have to find them as well and they have to report on them. And they go together sometimes. So that, what does that do? That gets them interested in things that are happening in Spanish that before they may not have ever taken the opportunity. So the community environment is, is very important as well for them to connect in Spanish with other Spanish speakers. Then the other thing, since I know I don't have too much time, um, the other project that I do, uh, which I'll just mention, I had a PowerPoint uh, for it. I don't know if I'll have to go through it very quickly. But it's, a, it's called the Abuelos Project. And it's a grandparents project. And the Abuelos Project um, was started years ago. And what we do is uh, it's an oral history project where we tell um, the students well, we talk about it a lot first before they go out and do it, but I have the students interview one of their grandparents. And if their grandparents is dead already, or if they're too far away, um, I tell them, well, you can either, if your grandparent is a techie and uses Skype, use Skype. And if they're not, then borrow one. Borrow an abuelo or an abuela. Go find an older person. What is my reason for that? The older person will have better Spanish, you know, will have more proficient Spanish. So I want them to practice in this project, not just the oral part, but also they're going to write about it. They have to do an interview. I'd say, put on your journalist hat. You are going to prepare the questions in advance. We dedicate part of one of the classes to do brainstorming in class. I said, what kind of questions do you think we might want to ask? And we put some up on the board. They, have, they work in groups. They come up with questions. And then we put some up on the board. And they can find their own questions, but these are just samples. I said, well, for, for instance, you can say, you know, ¿Por qué tuvo que salir de su país? 
Why did you have to leave your country? You know, what were the reasons? When did they leave? How did they feel about leaving their country behind? You know, did they ever go back? Who did they left behind? How was it learning English in the United States? If they went to the United States, some of them went to Spain or France or you know, some other place in Latin America. So what they ask, they have to develop the questions. What do you regret the most for having left? You know, would you want to go back? How do you feel about your your children and your grandchildren, you know, and their language issues. Do you think that, you know, that is important? Why, why not? You know, um, what is the best thing in your view about having come to this country, you know, and having to learn another language and culture and so on? So there are lots of questions. And what happens is that they, they do this interview, they prepare for the interview. Some of them record it, some of them videotape it. But I said, even if you do all of these things, you still need to do one of two things. You need to either write a short <clears throat> article, short means like eight pages, okay, double space. Either write an article or you're go with an introduction about the person, okay, or you're going to do an introduction uh, with the interview itself, which you have to edit, okay. And then <clears throat> in class, once they turn it in and I make some courses, in class we share some of these things with their permission. Some of them with permission, they show part of a video or something so we can actually hear the person. What does this do? It gets the students um, talking to their own family or a friend. You know, it's easy in Miami to find another grandparent, for example. We have a place called Domino Park, which is, <laughs> have you ever heard of it? It's full of senior citizens. It's a park, and uh, they're playing domino there every day. It's, mo it's men, though. They're all men. There are no abuelas there. It's a very sexist park. But they're men who play domino, and they're there all day, every day. And I tell them, if you cannot find your own grandparent, go to Domino Park. They'll be happy to talk to you. <laughs> Usually older people are happy when somebody comes and asks them about their lives. Some of the students have told me they're very ha glad that they did this project because now they have a recording of their grandmother or grandfather forever. You know, they have it for life. You know, they learn things about their family too that they never knew about. So that strengthens the ties, the familial ties, or with a friend or a neighbor that gets them thinking in Spanish because they have to do the interview in Spanish, right? And they also makes them write, okay? So that is just one activity that I think is successful for many reasons. It, it's tied to their culture. It's tied to also the events that happen so that if they, you know, if it's someone from um, Guatemala who left during the, all the civil horrible things that happened, civil unrest and wars that were going on there. And maybe they don't know that much about it. Maybe it's something they didn't want to talk about very much at home. Well, I assigned them then. Okay, then you're going to read this. Have you read Rigoberta Menchu? Mm -hmm. Have you read this? So I, in the book, you know, we find some extras. Or I've heard Argentinos, I have Argentines, you know, who didn't know much at all about the period that was military dictatorship. Uh, and they interviewed the grandparent. So, in a way, it's connecting the students to their roots, to their background, and the other students are also learning about the other students' background mm -hmm. and history. So my whole idea is that you cannot divorce the language development to the historical background, to the cultural background of all of these students in our heritage language classes, that they all need to learn uh, from each other as well. Some of the earlier textbooks that came out in the 1980s or so for heritage speakers for college level, they, they were all Mexican-American primarily oriented, which you know made sense because it's the largest group. But one of them, for example, a textbook that was called Nuestro Español, well, Nuestro Español was all Mexican. So how could I use that in Miami? It wasn't Nuestro Español. Um, there were others that uh, had very sad short stories. Uh, which we used because at that point there weren't that many books available. So I remember I gave in Chicago a talk about some of the materials a long time ago. Well, some of these materials, it's like one sad short story after the other. The, the first one was called Los Quemaditos by Tomás Rivera. And that is about, well, you can tell by the, by the name of the title, Los Quemaditos, the burnt ones. And it's about these little kids who are leave behind, they're left behind in a trailer because the parents have to go work in the fields. Well, when the parents come back, the, tra the trailer is burnt. The kids are dead because they were playing to be boxers and they put kerosene on their body and the thing caught on fire and they died. That's the first story these students are reading. <laughs> it's horrible. The second story is called um, La Noche Buena. And it's another famous story by another famous author. 
And this story is about an abuelita who is so poor, she cannot afford to buy a present for her grandchild. So she goes to a store, and what does she do? She takes something to give to the grandchild. Of course, she's caught by the police. So that was the second story. And the third story was about North Korean war, and it's about una caja de plomo que no se podía abrir. And of course, that is the, they're handing over, you know the story, right? They hand the, the uh, cenizas, the ashes of her son. They knock on the door. So it's like, I'm, am I teaching this? Oh my God, the students come to me and say, Professor Arroca, estos cuentos son tan triste. They're so sad. And I'm like, I have to make a book. I can't stand this anymore. And that's how I ended up writing a textbook. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, there, there's a lot of ways to get to these students to improve their Spanish, and it's not just beating them on the head with grammar. They do need grammar. I'm not denying that they need to improve their grammar and they have issues, but you <coughs> cannot make the class only a grammar class. They can take a class of grammar in the future as a separate class, but they need at this point to develop their oral abilities, to connect with their culture, to learn more about their culture, to learn to read and write. They have to learn to read. They don't read much at all. So if they don't read, then they cannot expand their vocabulary, okay? So the main thing is that. But going back to other issues with which I started, and I'll finish, is the whole problem of the policies in the United States. It's not, it, which is not a problem just of the native speaker track. It's a problem of language learning. Students do not uh, have to take study of a foreign language in this country as a requirement. You can graduate from high school without ever having studied any foreign language. And so the main problem, as I see it in the US, is a problem of lack of any kind of cohesive um, policy, which is different from other countries, because in other countries you have a Ministerio de Educación, mm. boom. You have a department, not that we don't have it here, we have a Department of Education, but because of the individuality of the United States, this, this whole gung-ho of individual rights of the states, then they don't um, make everyone study a foreign language or make anyone study anything. It's all decided by the <coughs> US, by the, each individual state has its own Department of Education. And so that, that is the problem. That needs to change, that needs to evolve so that everyone then is required to take a certain number of years of, of courses in a foreign language, any foreign language, obviously the one that makes a lot of sense right now since the population is Spanish speaking would be to study Spanish. And what happens is that students here study Spanish one and Spanish two, and then guess what? They go back again in college, if they go to college, and study Spanish one and Spanish two again. And they never go up to a higher level. Uh, very few people do. And very few people study a foreign language to start with. So I think that actually, in many ways, we're doing very well in the sense that we're doing a lot better than we were doing before, where we did not even have classes for native speakers. Um, my, my son, who is here, is an example of the heritage speaker because he was already born in the United States and he speaks Spanish. But of course, as a mother, I'm always afraid, oh, but is he going to maintain it? At this point, I'm, I'm um, confident that he will maintain it. But my question is, how far can someone who's had schooling um, in, here in the U.S. maintain the Spanish? It's a lot of effort. They need to continue studying it formally. If they don't do the reading, if they don't become literate, mm -hmm. then it's going to start being lost. So I think it's wonderful that you have the uh, uh, Cervantes Institute in the United States and here, but I think that uh, if you're not doing it already, and I think you are, I think that one of the classes uh, that it should be teaching more often is not just offering Spanish as a foreign or second language at the Instituto, but since we have this Observatorio now, to consider establishing classes also for the native speakers. I think they do offer them, but I'm not sure if it's offered everywhere. But it's something that is uh, to be considered by the Instituto, you know, because it, it would be important to develop the literacy. Anyhow, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.